Unfortunately, it was the passing of Sean Connery. I think it's fair to say everybody's favorite James Bond. That's the kind of week it's been. There are two feature films currently in production with some Celine Siama DNA. Um, awesome news despite all the COVID craziness um, and quite remarkable in a way. It's called Petit Mama. It's her fifth feature film. Uh, Kevin, what kind of intel do we have on this project? Um, there's not a whole lot out there yet about the film. We do know that it's currently shooting in Paris. Um, and it may potentially revolve around, the story may revolve around um, twin young girls uh, around seven to 10 years old. But other than that, we don't know much about the plot, except that um, Celine Siama has a new feature in the works. So she's examined teenage sexuality with water lilies. Um, I think a lot of people are gonna be comparing this to uh, Tomboy only because the potential protagonist is under the age of 10, uh, prepubescent. Um, she's, she's verified a reinvention with girlhood. And of course, um, she gave us a can's favorite with uh, Portrait of a Lady. Um, the, what we do know is that she's reteamed with her cinematographer, which is great news. Yeah, um, obviously, um, they, they've had a, a fruitful collaboration with Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Um, and yeah, it's familiar territory um, for the filmmaker, um, but it's territory where she has fine, where as you've explained, like she's found so much to say about um, coming of age um, as a young person, finding yourself, um, discovering who you are and, and what you desire. So um, I'm very fascinated to see what, um, what she uncovers this time around, what story um, she wants to tell. Yeah, the, um, the title Petit Mama means little mom, I guess. And I'd be, I'm curious to, to, to find out just how much of a role, if any, if there is a mother figure in the film. Um, I'm almost thinking, I'm thinking that um, the Petit Mama might be, you know, maybe children left alone, their own devices, um, Corita, uh, Kareda is, is, mm -hmm. is, is looked at this um, and um, what's going to be interesting is to see the visual palette. Um, I, I mean for me the big news um, here is the, is the DP is she's coming off um, Atlantique, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, two films that have a more larger vista and um, are perhaps experimental and classic at the same time. And so here, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see, is it gonna be apartment settings? Is it gonna be something that's more um, uh, smaller in detail, so, and, and therefore uh, puts the magnifying glass on these uh, smaller protagonists? Yeah, it's exciting news. And I feel like I, I'm saying this every single week, but again, like this could be another can selection. <laughs> Uh, I, I, yeah, it, it's exciting. Um, as we know, the, the her the Jacques Audiard film um, that she co-wrote is also currently shooting, although maybe it's wrapped already. So, um, two, two, yeah, two films in twenty twenty one uh, from Celine Sam is is definitely something to be excited about. Yeah. So production began in late October and is likely going to finish in early December. So. They're gonna have to rush it, but um, if Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival has an addition in the middle of the summer or later in the summer, then everything's possible. A virtual AFM is just around the corner. Um, there's a lot of packaging being done. Um, you're very, very familiar with this sector. Um, one project that was sort of like in the works being um, package and put together a little bit earlier last year is actually gonna rise to the top in this market. So um, we have, um, what I, I originally thought that the, the top line pairing here were, were uh, 
you know, just to like vouch for a project and push a project and hype up a project. And I always take it with a grain of salt, but I think this looks legit. So, um, Kevin, have these ice queens um, acted before? And what the hell are we talking about? So we are talking about uh, Mother's Instinct, um, a remake of a Belgian film uh, from a few years back by Olivier Massé de Passe. I pronounced that correct. Yeah. And it will have Jessica Chastain and Anne Hathaway taking the lead roles. Um, and they have not worked together before, if I'm correct. Uh, which is a pretty potent pairing. Um, uh, this is a thriller uh, about, it's set in the, fifth, in the 60s, about two sort of traditional housewives um, and a tragedy that takes place that sort of turns their world upside down um yeah uh, this is i believe this film's been sort of kicking around for a little bit but um it's always interesting when uh, a european filmmaker sort of comes to hollywood and redoes uh something they've made before i think the most recent example might be uh gloria uh, sebastian Melio's film good point um i think for me the concern is whenever a film happens to have some popularity uh Duel, uh, the film, um, the original, uh, was at the Toronto Film Festival. It played extremely well in Europe. I get a sense that it probably had distribution in the U.S., perhaps on a smaller scale, one of these Kino Lorber type outfitters. Um, I think for me, the question mark is always, how does the filmmaker keep it fresh? How does he... Um, take sort of like the larger story uh, narrative elements um, and, and the tone, but then does he play with that? Does he, does he go against the grain? Does he set in a different setting? Um, where is it gonna be based in the US? The fact that it takes place in the 60s, uh, 60s US is a hell of a lot different from um, what we might have seen in Europe. So I think there's elements there that that would make it exciting for this relatively new filmmaker. He's a couple of features in. Um, but yeah, something that uh, if they're pushing it to this early on for the market, that means they're probably gonna wanna go into production um, early next year. Yeah, you bring up a good point, um, which is always the question around these sort of remakes uh, is what the filmmaker is willing to explore. And I also, I also think for a filmmaker, it's probably exciting to see what, you know, people of, of Jessica Chastain and Anne, Hath and Anne Hathaway's caliber can bring to the roles, what they might do differently. And um, you're right, what the setting, what the American setting might open itself up to in terms of developing the story a little bit differently. Um, it's certainly one to watch. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure if it gets backing and, and quickly out of AFM, it is something they'll, they'll probably look to shoot sooner rather than later, for sure. Yeah, Chastain's on board as one of the main producers, I believe, so I think uh, this project will be a priority on our ever busy schedule of 2021. Another AFM market uh, must, um, and it's getting, I would say, a lot of traction. I quite like the production poster one sheet, but also the fact that We've got two great actors and it's based on what potentially looks like great material. So, um, Ama Ascent um, is on board. We imagine this to be a glossy project. Mads is on board, Army Hammer's on board. It's the bil billion dollar spy, Kevin. Um, is there anything else that we could do with the Cold War thriller spy subgenre? that hasn't done before. Is there a legit reason to be excited for this? Uh, I think I, well, I mean, Mads Mikkelsen, I'll watch in anything. So that's one reason to be excited. He's just a great actor. He can take anything and, and make it compelling. Um, you're right. I mean, this is fairly um, familiar ground, the, the Cold War thriller. Um, this one's based on a, on a true story um, about a CIA agent who forms a friendship with a um, an engineer uh, on the other side of the curtain. Uh, the twist here is that um, the CIA thinks he's a dangle, which is like um, sort of bait for the CIA. So he might not be trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, again, this is like, 
it's nothing new. I mean, we've seen this sort of story before. I think the exciting thing is, um, I think Emma Asante has quietly really built up a really interesting uh, filmography. Um, and she's sh shown ways to do things that seem familiar differently. Like most recently, she was directing episodes of the miniseries Mrs. America, and her episodes were actually really great. Um, really had a really brought the 70s to life in a way that I thought was unique um, with an interesting perspective and interesting voice. And so, it, and, we, and, we don't, and we don't often see women directing Cold War thrillers. So I think that alone will, will bring something different, uh, hopefully to the genre. Really good points you bring up. Um, this has the participation of Walden Media, which, you know, if you look at their recent filmography, it's like films of dogs. I, I, I don't get why they're involved with this IP. Um, but the idea of heroic individuals, um, I think there's always, uh, that's a key element for to bring audiences uh, in. Um, the scribe for this is, is someone fairly new. He did Adam Agoyan's Remember. His name is Benjamin August. Not sure what to expect there. The fact that he's perhaps familiar with, with, you know, visiting the past might be something that's that. I think you bring up a good point about the production. I mean, you're right. Walton Media is a bit of an odd, an odd ball uh, element of this, and I believe Akiba Gold Goldsman is one of the producers, and he's just made a ton of blockbuster trash. So I'm a, I'm, a, you're right. I'm a bit surprised to see that sort of involvement, but. Who knows? Like that's that's the X factor here, I guess, with this project. But um, I mean, we'll see how it goes. I mean, the actors are great, the material has promise, and the and the director is great too. So um, yeah, I like I like the the uh, polyvalent angle to Mads uh, Mildskin. That, that you know, he could pretty much play any um, any background, uh, um, any nationality, and and for Army Hammer, I think. He's got one of those faces where where you can place him just about any um, any decade and any kind of like uh, vantage point, and uh, I, I think he 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 exceeds. He usually overperforms. Um, this is going into production in 2021 in Eastern Europe, so a lot of cobblestones and and backdrops that'll that'll feed uh, give this a lot of production value. So something that we could look out for or towards. 2022 and most likely at a festival like TIFF where everything goes back to normal. Richard Pryor biopic has, feels like a, a very stubborn diesel operated uh, lawnmower. Um, it's just, it won't start when it's supposed to start. It's, it's, it's been kicking around, uh, being tossed around. There's been a lot of interest, uh, you know, big time players that, that um, for some, whatever reason, Richard Pryor means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. We have Eddie Murphy that was in, involved at some point, Oprah, JC, Netflix, the list goes on. But I, I sort of like the approach that, um, well, it's worth saying that MGM won a bidding war and that bidding war comes with a package with a, a filmmaker that's essentially making his debut, but he's still a known entity. So let's let's dig into perhaps the, the history of a film that just wouldn't start and the involvement of uh, Kenya Barris. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as long as I've been writing about movies, the Richard Pryor biopic has been kicking around. Uh, you're right, everyone you mentioned has been involved at one point. I think the closest that ever came was Bill Condon directing Marlon Wayans at one point, uh, and that just never happened. I was, I was at Sony. But Kenya Barris is, is, um, is uh, am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah. has been, um, has, has made, has, has made, has made their mark in TV with um, Blackish and Grownish, uh, has a, uh, ironically a big deal currently at Netflix, um, which rumor is that uh, they might actually back out of it and, and go back to CBS or, or whatnot. But it's a huge name, uh, one that has made huge waves in the industry, um, coming up, uh, the uh, co-writing the script of um, coming this coming to America sequel. So it's an it's a solid choice to write this project. But I think for me, the 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 thing is is like I will believe that this movie is 
happening when it's in the theater. <laughs> but, I, until then, like, it's just another iteration of this forever developing project. I, w I was putting some thought to Richard Pryor and, and, you know, his career was multifaceted to an extent. He did TV, did film, he did stand-up comedy. Um, his uh, his uh, public life was very much on display. Um, we saw the, the best and the worst of this character. Um, so his widow is actually one of the producers on the project. Um, I think my big concern seeing that it's gone through so many variations is, is are we going to find something that's perhaps uh, less, uh, more tame um, when we consider the, the, the PC climate that we're in right now? Because Richard Pryor, when he was in hell, um, um, yeah, you, you wouldn't want to be in those shoes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the question with every biopic, right? Is, is, how, much, is how far are they willing to actually show um, the darker side of a, of a public personality, one who is, who is very much beloved and inspired, you know, a, easily a generation, if not two generations of, of uh, comics. Um, and I guess that will be, that will, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Um, but I don't think you can tell the Eddie Murphy story honestly without getting into those elements of his, of his life um, that were uncomfortable and that were, and that were difficult. Um, so we'll see. I mean, we'll see. But I, but I will say that I think, um, you know, someone like uh, like uh, Kenya Barris is um, is not going to be afraid to go down that road. So, um, and I and I think MGM buys a project like this, knowing that the people are getting involved with, they're going to want to do it honestly. So I, I I don't force. I mean, I'm hopeful, and I I think they'll they will treat it with uh, with the candor it deserves to be. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think it's going to speak to a lot of, uh, I mean, he had a legion of fans. There, there's this whole other demographic that, you know, might not be familiar with him or the George Carlins or, or some of the old school um, uh, comedians um, or even like Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles. Uh, what I'm hopeful is that we can get some behind the scenes of the actual set. So like film within a film, uh, that would be a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll believe it when we see it, or at least when it goes into production. As is the case with several projects that get mounted, sometimes certain elements fall through. Um, a pick that depicts 1960s underground abortion movement originally had Elizabeth Moss in the lead. Uh, now we're switching Elizabeths. So um, a project that is floating to the top again. Again, it's the AFM very soon. It's called Call Jane. Um, Phyllis Nagy is on board to direct. Um, what do you think about this renaissance of films that go back to the 60s and, six, and 70s? Also TV series like Miss America um, and the Glorias and, and take um, a pulse of what that era represents then and certainly the remnants of what it might be like in the current future? Um, I mean, I, I think as, you know, it's, it's that thing, the further away you get from something, sometimes the more perspective you have. And I certainly think Hollywood is in a place now where they're willing to make, you know, st more stories about women, more stories that, you know, we wouldn't, that no one was going to green light, you know, even as even as re recently as like ten years ago. Yeah. So um, I think that's that's helping a lot. Um, and and this story, you know, about um, about the underground abortion uh, movement and helping other people uh, make make um, choices that that were difficult at the time um, is exciting. It's interesting, and I and. I'm curious to see what uh, Phyllis Nagy does with this. Um, and certainly she has a pretty intriguing cast on board yeah. with her, um, with Elizabeth Banks, Sigourney Weaver, uh, Kate Mara, and, and Rupert Friend. Um So Elizabeth yeah. Banks plays the person that seeks the help and then finds a, a large supportive network, which is sort of like on the, on the lowdown. Um, 
as, with concerns to uh, Phyllis Nagy, so she's the scribe for uh, Todd Haynes, Carol, and she, uh, people are mentioning this is her directorial debut. Yes, true, it's her feature uh, theatrical debut, if you want to call it that, but she also did a film called Miss Harris in 2005, which starred um, Annette Bening, which I happened to see, and so uh, what's clear with all these three projects is that she's very comfortable with portraying a period in Americana, uh, in, in US history. And um, yeah, expounding on your point, um, I'm really happy to see uh, stories told by women for women about women. And um, clearly there's, um, it'll just give us more uh, into that perspective and, and um, yeah, I'm quite excited about this. Yeah, and um, you're right. I mean, you know, uh, this filmmaker did make a film before, and it should be also noted that um, Mrs. Harris was nominated for a slew of awards. Was nominated for three Golden Globes, like, like easily, like a ton of uh, primetime Emmy awards. So uh, this is not a rookie making her first film. <laughs> this, is, this is someone who knows her way, who knows her way around a film set and telling a story. So, uh, yeah, this is one to definitely keep an eye on. And I think the backers are pretty interesting too. Do you wanna, who are the backers again? Um, it's the team that was behind uh, Dallas Buyers Club. Oh yes, the, yeah, the yeah. production team, yeah. yeah. So this is set to shoot next spring. So um, again, I'm sounding like a broken record, but 2021 items that are likely gonna be um, slotted in 2022. And this one doesn't have a distributor in place. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a pickup prior to film festival uh, announcement. So yeah, uh, more stuff for the spring. It's really exciting. This bromance that's been forming between Netflix, Adam Sandler, and Adam Sandler has been able to work with a whole, like seriously a different array of filmmakers whether it's like micro indie filmmakers or well-established, you know, studio comedy types, um, and this, this, the the metrics behind this is 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 quite interesting. Um, and I wanted to look back at the career of this filmmaker and sort of like where is he coming from, and obviously what he's best known for today. So, yeah, what's the what's the name of the project, and who is Adam Sandler working with? So Adam Sandler is working uh, with. Um... Johan Rank, who just, who most recently made the incredible uh, Chernobyl for HBO. And just today, actually, randomly, I saw he shot a um, Chanel ad with Marion Cotillard. <laughs> that was <laughs> online. That was kind of random. But uh, they're making um, The Spaceman of Bohemia, which will find uh, Adam Sandler playing an astronaut um, who, who starts talking or communicating with a creature on his ship. Um, while trying to put together his life on Earth, trying to put his life on Earth back together. Um, he has a marriage that's, that's falling apart. And it's based on the novel of the same name by Yaroslav Kalfar, um, I believe he's a Czech writer. So this is another, you know, another swing at drama by Adam Sandler, but we know he can do it. Yeah, a Chernobyl for me is, um, I came to it a little bit late, but, um just uh, like immense talent uh, there on the screen. And I believe this filmmaker has a background in commercials, has a background in um, music videos. And we see that a lot. We see people that have strong uh, capabilities. They have the tool set, they know the visual language, and then they get into cinema and it's just flop after flop. And, um, I think Chernobyl, what this did for this filmmaker is gave him a new lease on, on telling fiction on a larger uh, scope. Yeah, that's a really great point. The, the leap from, uh, you know, for every director like David Fincher who goes from commercials to features, there's about a dozen more that, that just, can't, uh, just can't make the transition. Their features just feel like, you know, a hundred commercials cut together. It's just, they don't, they don't understand the language is different. Um, but yeah, you're right. With Chernobyl, he really he really made his mark. He had worked in television for a bit too. He shot episodes of um, 
Breaking Bad and Bloodline and um, Halt and Catch Fire. So he had an, he, it seems like he took his time um, developing his craft before leaping into the long form Chernobyl. And um, this will be an interesting uh, excursion. I mean, this is Adam Sandler playing an astronaut. Um, this is a big leap, I think, for both of them, but I think they're both in good hands with each other to, to sort this out, to make it work. Yeah, so most likely the Netflix will take up a, a large studio space. It's one of those shoots that could last easily uh, within the two to three month range. It, essentially, they take over a city, maybe in North America. And um, yeah, a lot of set building, and a, a little bit of green screen perhaps. And um, But if it does go into the dramatic terrain, um, I think for some of the fanboys, it, it'll be fun ju just to see um, Sandler again go into a, a, a tool set that he doesn't visit often enough. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you see recent interviews, I was reading something recently where uh, when he was cast for Punch Drunk Love, uh, he, he, he was cast and then he went to go see Magnolia after. <laughs> and he was a bit, and the story goes that he was like so freaked out that he wouldn't be able to, to hack it that he almost dropped out of the film. So I think he finally has the confidence that he can do these kind of roles. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how that works. I think one of the other interesting things here is that among the producers is actually uh, Channing Tatum and Reed Carolyn, mm -hmm. um, which is a pretty interesting association uh, to bring into this as well. So it's a, an interesting mix of collaborators. Um, and it's kind of nice to see Adam Sandler um, not waiting another four years to do this kind of role and kind of just jumping right back in and, and um, mixing up his usual fare uh, and challenging himself um, quickly again. Yeah, and he's also working on a smaller sports-related film with Netflix as we speak. So, uh, yeah, the it's a bromance for that studio, for this actor. Um, it, it's all there in the metrics. Um, but, yeah, something to look forward to in the Adam Sandler sphere. Thank you once again, Kevin. We wish you a fantastic Sunday and a great week ahead. You too, man. Always a pleasure. I'm Eric Lavallee, I'm Editor-in-Chief and Site Owner for IonCinema.com, and this is Kevin Jaggernaut, Contributing Writer for The Playlist. And together we are Indie Sponge.